Knox Country Podcast Edition. I've always been around great songwriters and artists my whole life. I'm Michael Knox. Welcome to my world. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jason Aldean, and you are listening to my boy Michael Knox on Knox Country Podcast. Welcome to the Knox Country Syndicated Radio Show Podcast. I got a longtime friend this week, uh, Jesse Alexander. I've known I've known you since the '90s, but I'm a lot older than you. I think 99. You, I think you were 12. <laughs> That's right. And and I, and I was 30 then. But um, but I've known you a long time, and I knew you when you had your record deal, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, but you've evolved into probably one of the most sought out singer songwriters in town. So um, we can start with that just a little bit because I know mm-hmm. I know the singer songwriter thing is really what is really working these days, you know, for everybody trying to sing your songs. And and I I know a lot of people that hear your demos and try to cop your demos and try to do what you do. So. You know, how was that? How was that quick transition? Because you went from artist to songwriter pretty fast. Man, it was actually really hard uh, because in in Nashville, it feels like when you're a recording artist, when you write with people, they want to write for you. What do you need? What is your What do you need left on your record? Uh, what do you want to say? And so after I, you know, terminated the record deal and decided that that really wasn't what I wanted to do, that I wanted to focus on writing songs. It was hard to kind of convince my co-writers, you know, no, I don't want to write for me anymore. Let's write for Blake Shelton, especially being a girl. You know, I had two things kind of going against me because, um, A, people, there weren't a lot of females writing songs for men at the time. And B, I sing, you know, the way I sing. So people would say, well, gosh, sounds so good when you sing it. Why don't you just make a record? So it was actually very hard. I had to completely rebrand myself and it just took years of persistence and then cuts, you know, and hits. But the climb through that, having Molly Cyrus um, song, The Climb Out was kind of deceiving because I was singing that demo um, and they, you know, recorded it a lot like my demo or me and John Mabe's demo. But it really, it made me think, oh, I should be writing female songs, but in the end, it really was. I found my sweet spot when I started writing for men. Now, when you were when you did the climb, were you writing that for yourself at the time? That's a cool story. I was really writing that out of sheer frustration. So um, I'd been kind of out of my record deal for a couple years and was floundering. I was haven't had haven't really had any hits yet as a songwriter. I'd had Trisha Yearwood cuts, Patty Loveless cuts, things like that. No singles. And I was really seriously kind of thinking about quitting. I mean, I'll just be honest. It was, I bet every songwriter that's had this journey has that moment where you're like, gosh, I'm done. You know, this, I've done this, I've done that. You know, nothing's worked. Should I just move back to Jackson? Should I just be a mom? Like there was all these questions. And really those lyrics came out of like a self-help, you know, I can almost see it, that dream I'm dreaming. There's a voice inside my head saying, you, you know, it's like that was all me and John Mabe, underdogs, writing that lyric. And that's just a co-write, is that right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but that song, no offense, that was a big crossover, a huge yeah. crossover. And wasn't that, um, didn't it get pulled from the Grammys or some weird thing because it wasn't pitched to her for a particular thing or something? Totally. Is that, what, it, what, what was that? It was, that song was such a crazy journey, you know, because here we are in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm writing country songs. In my mind, that was a country song. Uh, and we demoed it right here close to the studio as a country song. But, you know, it was a song that kind of, it it went beyond genres. It was the lyric that they loved and the melody. But uh, they recorded it, you know, obviously did everything it did. And then when it came time for Grammys, it was nominated. And I was so excited. People were sending me flowers and like I'm celebrating my first Grammy nomination. And then the next day I get the phone call that nobody ever wants to hear, which is, we're pulling in the nomination. Basically, um, they there was a discrepancy about if we had written it for the film, <clears throat> and it, it was a gray area, you know, because when I when we wrote the song, it was called "It's the Climb." It was third person. We rewrote a lot of the lyric and melody to fit that movie. So it's hard to know, you know. It's it, it it's there's uh, there were several other songs that you could say. Well, you know, there's lots yeah, of gray yeah, but, area, but mm-hmm. but. Was it written for the movie? Who cares? I mean, that's like saying the Guardians of the Galaxy album can't be nominated for a Grammy because none of those songs were written 
for the movie. Exactly. You and, know, and, and you're like, well, that's not fair because it's a, still a great song for the project and for it the fit project. great and, and it brought really brought life to something. Uh, yes. You know, that that that's kind of interesting. It was a heartbreaker, I'll tell you. You know, we really, it, we, were, we were crushed and yeah. so was Miley. It was, re- it was really hard. But, you know, that was another time in my journey, which there's been several where, you know, you just got to get back up and you just so okay, what next? Yeah, Dust but something, something you said a minute ago, you said, man, I, I was having cuts by Patty Loveless, mm-hmm. Trisha Yearwood. I mean, and yeah. I brought this up before to people and it'll be interesting to hearing it from a female. You you were a young girl in a woman's world mm-hmm. back then. Yeah. Now you're a woman kind of in a very young yeah. girl's world. I mean, is that is that how different is that approach for your writing? Because you're the veteran now. Now you're mm-hmm. walking in the room going, hey, let me teach you all how to ice this cake. Let me teach you how to finish this song. I know the yeah. loop's cool, but let's let's figure out how to finish this song. It's so much easier, to be honest. It's like you're not climbing up this uphill, you know, it's just you know now you've got I've got a little bit of you know, trust within my co-writers plus I get to write with the best of the best of the best when you're a young writer you know you're writing with people as good as you are or maybe not even as good so that was the first thing that I felt was man just put me in the room with David Lee Murphy let me show him what I got you know put me in the room with Neil Thrasher or you know, whoever. I mean, I could list them all day long, but I finally got to really learn from those people and they elevated me. And now I get to use so that the new writers that are coming in, they've got such fresh perspective and melodies and phrasing, and it's just fun. It's like getting yeah. to be in the toy box. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Well, but that's kind of what you were when you were coming out. Right. Because I remember being there firsthand watching you as a songwriter and, and people being afraid of it. Not mm-hmm. understanding it, yeah. even though it was yeah. cool, and um, and 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 it was pretty neat to see that evolution. And that's what's neat to have you here talking, you know, for for people listening, just going, "Hey, man, I'm, you know, uh, maybe I'm not country. I don't know what country is. You know, country is really diverse right now. Mm-hmm. When they really country is a lifestyle. It's totally. your lifestyle. It's a songwriter's lifestyle. Yeah. It really ain't. It really ain't. You know, music or anything like that. It's it's just where we come from and what the artist is where he's coming or she's coming from yeah. but um but I, I thought that was awesome watching that watching that perspective of you growing into this veteran songwriter now 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 whenever we're in meetings and everybody's looking for female songwriters your name's always brought up saying well i need a i need a jesse alexander i, I or i need this or i need that and they always mention your song or something uh-huh. so that, that that's got to be cool it's, feeling now but now it's it's 10 years of very yes. hard 10 15 years of very hard work absolutely i mean if they told me when i moved here that it was going to be a 10-year town or that it was a 10-year town i remember thinking that's crazy you know um and i'm very fortunate that i grew up you know in a real blue collar family you know promotions and 401ks and things like that don't you know I'm t- we're talking factory workers mechanics carpenters those kind of people or, or how I was who I was raised by so you know all this is like gravy to be honest yeah. you know I, I would have a day job and I'd be working hard wherever it is or was um, so I kind of look at it my job like that and when I get singles and things like that it is it's a huge bonus don't get me wrong but I live for the process you know and live for the saying something different spinning something spinning a day with a legend i mean it just doesn't get any better for me than those days when i just get to sit with my friends and rework it's like i'm it's like i look at it as a craft i guess yeah is there anything i mean we'll we'll get in and talk about specific songs but is there anything that you're still trying to reach you know that that you're a goal you're still really really wanting to reach i mean uh you know because you've accomplished a lot you know and i know it's easy you know to get to get caught up in that but i mean but is there a personal thing that you're like man i i'm still wanting that yeah i think after i won song of the year um for i drive your truck there was a little bit of a like what now i mean really that was it that was it for for my whole career song of the year is what i wanted and then when i achieved that i did have to really do some self inventory and think what now and obviously you know there's this thing called triple play award that's really hard to get and especially for a female there's not been many i would love that 
If you, do you want to explain what that is? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, triple play listeners? award is is three number ones in one year. Yes, you it's know, like and almost impossible. But that's crazy. With that, that that the fem- uh, that a female hadn't really. Uh, I don't see them on that stage a lot. You line. don't, and, and, and so that's well, a big well, What one. do you think that? I mean, is it just because a lot of males are singing those things? You know, but but it's funny. The females are, are buying the records the most. Yeah, you, it seems like a female writer would kind of fight its way in there a little. But but when y'all do, it's huge. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's song of the year. It's the climb. it's humble and it's, kind. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, um, I think it's just odds. I, I don't think I, I really you know I don't have a like, big issue like some people do about you know females where you don't get enough of this you don't get that. I feel completely adored, accepted, um, you know, applauded by. I mean, men every day. I'm with men, and I never feel like set, set aside or I feel like very valued but I think it's just the odds you know there's just not many of us we could probably both count on two hands the top 10 female right you know there's yeah. just not many of us so there's that one but I would say the bigger goal even beyond triple play because that is a, a really hard one is truly longevity I mean I'd like to have another couple big get a couple good licks in you know and just keep doing it. Well, when we were at when we were at Warner Chapel together, the goal as a plugger was always saying, "Hey, man, I want to get my songwriter one single a year." Yeah, I would rather have one single a year than to have nine in one year and then nothing for six years. Right. Just one a year will build that kind of consistency, yes. that confidence, or whatever you know. So, but but you have got that consistency, you know, and you know, um, you you mentioned I drive your truck, which is is one of my favorite songs of yours you know I, I love your blake stuff i love the miley stuff but but that if i drive your truck is a monster and that's song of the year i rem- i was at the awards that year when it got that incredible you know now wh- who's all on that one with you okay so that is connie harrington and jimmy yuri and it's a really cool story connie harrington was actually driving home from burns tennessee and she was listening to an npr special and she really caught the middle of this interview but it was a dad talking about his son who he had lost in Afghanistan and the interviewer said well man what are you going to do today for Memorial Day to honor your son and he said I don't know man I guess I'm just going to go drive his truck and so Connie like pulls over their post-it notes and takes down everything she could about this truck and we uh, I was the lucky girl I mean this is where you know you and I call it fate Um, for me it's a God thing but anybody could have been in that room that next day and I, I was pregnant with the twins. I didn't even want to go to work that day. It was hot July day. And I rolled in, and she had all those Post-it notes. And every time she would want to tell me the story, she'd start crying. And she couldn't even get the title out. And I kept. she'd go, oh, we don't want to write that. Let's write something else. I'd go, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I'd say, what's that song again? That or Give me that uh, whole story. She'd lead me all the way to the story and never get to the hook. Finally, she said, I drive your truck. And I just bullseye you know we all songwriter to live for not just a great title but there's something that i hadn't written about to answer your question for a long time and i i'd lost my mom to cancer ovarian cancer when i was really young and i'd wanted to write about grief but it's such a hard thing to do and i needed time to live and when she said that i knew that was god's gift for me to yeah. pour that emotion into a song and we you know, I wrote all these lyrics and we're thinking about, I'm thinking about my granddaddy's truck. She's thinking about her dad's truck. We're writing all this stuff. But this is when I think a kind of pivotal part of the story is we could have written it that day. I mean, I play guitar, I sing, we could have been done, but I just had this really, you know, strong conviction that we needed a male in the room. And this was partly because I wasn't getting cuts as a female singer. I needed that voice. Um, And so Jimmy Erie comes in, we, we call him in, and he brings this unbelievable energy and melody, and we wrote it, and it definitely changed our lives that day. We knew it. We knew, we didn't know what it would be, but we just knew we nailed that emotion for those people. Yeah. Uh, the Gold Star families, that was, it was their song, you know? Yeah. Hey, y'all, this is Jesse Alexander, and you're listening to Knox Country. And and, and go back to what you said a minute ago. It is hard to get personal and also be commercial. 
a way where everybody understands what you're saying and yeah. it, and it's something they can relate to because it is a transition to I mean because I've I get some of the best songs turned in and there's nobody for them but yeah. you're like oh my god this is an incredible song but it really re- it really relates to nobody but the person that wrote it totally. you know so for y'all to have that moment where you do that and everybody goes oh man I get that. I mean that's huge. I mean, but that's a song of the year. That's why it's a song of the year. Oh man, it was it was the gift that kept on giving. You know, we flew Paul Monty, who we found. That was the guy that said it. He's in Massachusetts, and we flew him down for the number one party. And we actually, through talking to him, find out that we actually wrote the song on the day that his son died. You know, so many things like that mm-hmm. where it was just beyond us. And now it's actually going to be in a movie that's coming out. Call it. It's called. It all begins with a song. Um, and. So y'all be um, looking out for that because they actually flew me and Connie to Boston to actually drive the truck. And That's awesome. It was an incredible moment in our journey with that song. I got to go in Jared's room and put on his baseball glove and you know drive his truck, and it truly was like better than a Grammy. Is that going to be Lee's version? Um, actually, I actually sing it in the film. That's awesome. I mean, but that's yeah. cool. It, it could find a whole other yeah thing. Yeah. Did it help you with, with your grief? It, it it did. I mean, you know, the whole song has. And it's like, I still have to sing that song all the time. People come up to me and they cry. And I was about to say, know, I'm sure it's helped a lot of people and you've gotten response. Absolutely. About it. it really, it kind of checked one of the boxes. I have a lot of things I need to write about. But that was a big yeah. box. You know, yeah, I mean, but that was a cool one that happened with you not being an artist. Totally. You know, and, 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 uh, and to watch that transition, you know, the... Um, um, uh, you know, from Lee taking it to making it his song. I mean, because a lot of people think he was a writer on it, you know. Right. But um, but that's awesome. I, I I didn't know that whole story. That's great. Yeah, it's so really so neat. when's this thing coming out? What what's this? So I'm actually flying to Cannes Film Festival in France in a couple of weeks to be on the panel and perform it for the film festival. They just showed it at the Nashville Film Festival. I'm sure we're going to be going to all the major film festivals and then hopefully they'll shop it to Netflix and HBO and things like that. But it's an incredible behind the scenes of Nashville songwriters. And, uh, you know, I've just honored to be a part of it. It's really cool. All right. Now, now the other, uh, I don't know, the, the Blake Shelton, mine would be you, which was a huge song. I mean, as well, you know, but that one didn't win song of the year, but it was, it was nominated, nominated for against, song of the year. It was yeah. nominated against I Drive Your Truck. Oh, well, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's what right. it was. Yeah, that's she right. Was... It was the same year. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so so your odds, if you would have lost, you would have been like, man, nobody likes me. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I'm like 40%. It was like having two of your babies up on stage and they have to pick one. You know? <laughs> It was awful. I mean, it was awesome and awful. So did you stand up going, yeah, and you looked at the co-writer and the other one going, oh. Oh. (laughs) No, it was tough because we were all there. But yeah, Mine Would Be You is, is for a long time, was my favorite song I'd ever written. And it just, it's just so special. Who was all that with? So that's Connie Harrington again. So after we wrote I Drive Your Truck, we were like, oh, okay, we've got, we know what the formula is. Sometimes that's what songwriting is about, is figuring out who you're best with or I mean we're I'm very superstitious so you could even be which guitar what room you know yeah, um, and yeah. and so we've realized like wow we write really good together we just need this third writer a male again again what the hell so we called in Derek Rattan who's an incredible uh, songwriter an old friend of mine who we'd never written together and she just she's fumbling through titles like she does and she's like mine would be you blah 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 she keeps going and me and Derek are both yes and it just poured out that the whole first half and this is when I was still pregnant with the twins Um, I was like guys I'm tired like can we get on this because we kind of came to a stop with the song we couldn't finish it and we're like let's think about it and uh, I was like, why don't y'all come over maybe next week or something? We'll cook dinner and we'll wrap up that song. So when we, they got there, they were drinking wine and eating pizza and all the stuff. And we l- listened back and we we're like, all we all felt exact same. Like this isn't a love. This is a heartbreak song. So weird. If we had finished it that day, it would have been the way it was. But people always wonder, why is it twist at the end? You know, with um, the taillights fading and daylight breaking and all that and you know that was a personal 
uh, memory that I'd had uh, that I kind of drew from, but we all did. But we knew that that was a heartbreak song. And one more funny um, little tidbit about that song is when we put it down on our work tape, we actually said makeup kiss. That's the way it was always written. Put your hands down, best ever makeup kiss. But at the time, I had drink on it on the radio, and we have prick in the song. <laughs> so I know Blake loves cussing. I mean, just like <laughs> I do. And the more provocative, the better. And that's always kind of been me and Blake's thing. So I remember when we... I said, can we play it down one more time and put makeup sex in there? Because I mean, me and Derek both kind of heard it at the same time. And sure enough, I sent it straight to Blake, and he, he was like... I'm done. That's it. I'm cutting it. Well, how did that relationship happen with you and Blake? Really through, I guess through Miranda. You know, Miranda Lambert and I were assigned to Sony together. And Blake, it's always just, we just kind of of the same class. Yeah. You know, people like Dirk Bentley. I mean, I was at his first showcase. You know, it's just fun to watch. Aldine, of course, we were together yeah. on Warner, at Warner Chapel. But Blake's just, we've kind of been in this similar cir- circles. But I would have never guessed that he would be the artist that's recorded the most of my songs i mean truly i mean i've got two on this last record we wrote a song for angry birds the animated film is that friends (laughs) friends yeah you know um pretty much you know this new song on the record uh, turning me on we actually wrote together he sends me little snippets of him singing like he's at the voice and he'll you know play something (laughs) So is that kind of how y'all write? He'll he'll yeah. he'll send text each other back mess ideas or whatever, and then just kind of finish them that way. Exactly. Do y'all ever end up in the room? We are never together. We never collaborate together. Well, y'all need to remember that because it's working. It's the working. The first time y'all get together, you probably won't ever write anything good. Exactly. You'll be like, oh, you need to go back to California and I'll exactly. send you something. <laughs> so much fun. So how, how how many Blake things have you had cut? Oh my god. I mean, like ten. Yeah. Really? I mean, I've had two on every record for the last four records at least two I mean you know and then we all these little miscellaneous things I'm really really proud of these two uh, on this record turned me on and got the t-shirt and then on the last record he sent me a gospel song idea that he had dreamed Uh, and it was really special it's called Save Your Shadow it's a Christian kind of old school gospel song so I mean I love that he relies on me for his heart and soul and you know I'm kind of I hope to be there with Red Akins and uh, Craig Wiseman as kind of his Dean Dillon. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's it's really neat. So, and I always loved singing on his records. I work a lot with Scott Hendricks now and sang on all the records. So, it's cool. That's good. Yeah, and, and Scott's pretty uh, particular in the studio. He is, but not so much with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People say that, but... When you leave, he like, yeah, he'll like, like tune your vocals all night. <laughs> exactly. But, this um, is like an hour tune right here. Exactly. Which is because you nail it. Well, exactly. That's what it is. Exactly. <laughs> Knox Country Podcast Edition. Some of you know me as a record producer for acts like Jason Aldean and Thomas Rhett. Others know me as the son of rock and roll legend Buddy Knox, party doll fame back in 1957. I'm Michael Knox. Welcome to my world. You're listening to Knox Country Podcast. Podcast. Hey, this is Keith Urban. What's up, y'all? It's your boys here, Florida Georgia Line. Hey, this is Little Big Town. And you're listening to Knox Country. You've entered Knox Country. Welcome back to the Knox Country Podcast. Aldean and I are just now getting in your space. Come on. You know, and uh, I mean, because uh, we always talk about writers, and you're somebody we're always like going through some catalog, but yeah. up in smoke on the new record. Yeah. Yeah, that's your first Aldine cut. It is. Yeah, and um, so that ball just started. So I'm I'm so glad. I mean, you, it's a hard, it's a hard bullseye to hit. Well, and, how much do you write with David Lee? Oh, we've written a lot. Um, oh, we've written for for years together, and we just started having. We just got a song on the new Thomas Rhett record called "When You Look Like That." Is that your first Thomas Rhett mm-hmm. cut? That, and see, then, that, that's cool. You're starting some yeah, new some new doors, and that's. That was the other kind of goal, you know, I have a lot of little goals, um, and just kind of wanted to branch off into some new territory, and that, I had to adjust a lot of the ways I write and people I write with, but I, you know, don't forget my my roots, but people like uh, Josh Thompson, who's been an old friend of mine for many years, you know, we started getting on a run together, or Chase McGill, or David Lee Murphy, Ben Hayslip, these people that I kind of always knew, but we just found a sweet spot together, and 
that's been really fun and yeah, also you, stay at this music being at a new publishing company but that whole crew you just mentioned man those are guys that have really uh set a set a tone including yourself for nashville you know that, that a lot of people outside of nashville don't understand you know but but all those guys you mentioned including dallas davidson and mentioning josh thompson you said david lee rodney mm-hmm. clausen all these guys there's a serious tone that they set in the you know past 10 years you know in in our format oh, yeah. you know and, and and that's neat i mean but, but that's neat to see all that grow and to have you in the middle of that too you know but but now you're you're married to an interesting songwriter oh yes absolutely i'm so i you know talking about the song of the year that was always my goals because i had to walk back and forth across my house and see one on the mantle for 10 years he wrote whiskey lullaby so in 2005 and, you know, and, who, and who's your husband john randall. john randall and he's a you know incredible songwriter and gosh i mean having to look at that song of the year every day and think man i want one of those <laughs> um now does he ever walk by and go man you're not gonna get it because you're a female no, God. <laughs> no, I hope not. Are they, um, are they sitting side by side so now? So now we have his and her song of the years, but now go. he just won again for Tin oh, Man. I saw that. I saw that Tin Man. Yeah. So that pressure's all. on. Pressure's on That's for me. That's great. You got a lot going on right now to, 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 not, to compete I'm, with that. I'm not too worried, but uh, he, yeah, he's an incredible songwriter. He approaches songwriting very different. It's really cool. We uh, are such kind of different songwriters, but yet when we collaborate, we always come up with something special we have a new artist someone that i've really kind of wanted to be a part of their journey and i just love so much as a georgia native travis denning who's coming out um on universal and um his first single we wrote together called david ashley parker from powder springs yeah now, now i've heard that it's an odd Mm-hmm. like title it really catches you because you're like well that's weird what's this about <laughs> yeah and then you put it on and then that long hook comes in and you're like that's kind of cool yeah so yeah. basically it's travis denning's first fake id yeah. yeah and the whole song is about how you got it and uh who you embody and the character you are um but that's been really awesome also we have a song that we wrote just the two of us that's going to be on dirk Bentley's new record so that's really special that we just wrote like in our kitchen and you know we're both always writing songs in our head so it makes for an interesting marriage because you're you don't know when to turn it off and sometimes you can never turn it off you know we'll put the kids to bed and be up till three in the morning working on something so now when you're writing and you need and you need that third does he get mad when you call somebody else it is funny because there's been several (laughs) times that he's like i think it was oh it was an old trish yearwood song but i I had the idea it's called nothing about memphis that she recorded but i threw him that title the night before and he was like watching the mavericks play on television (laughs) or something i was like okay you're lost and i wrote it the next day and with tommy lee james and she recorded it so yeah we definitely both miss out on things but it's okay Uh, now john is part of that project that um songwriters album you recorded right down home isn't he featured oh, yes. on yes. that? So tell us a little bit about um, that album. Oh, that, oh, yeah. Okay. So so I play a lot of songwriter shows now, um, which is really cool. The show Nashville has really put a spotlight on songwriters. And people like me and Neil Thrasher and Wendell, I've, we do these gigs where we play for corporate events or parties, and, and we just play songs we've written. It's so much fun. But after every show, pretty much every time someone's like, I want your version of The Climb, or I want your version of I Drive Your Truck. So I just went in the studio at Gary Pachoza's house and legendary producer. And I just said, I want to record what it sounds like when I play live. So we just got in circle, me and JR and Richard Bennett. And we just literally first takes live vocals. You know, they we added uh, embellishments to every song. And most importantly, we added like a special guest to every song. So like Chris Stapleton and Morgan are singing on The Climb or Dirk Bentley singing on Mine Would Be You. Cheryl Crow's on it. Um, Charlie Worsham. So many great, uh, me and uh, Brothers Osborne in the record. So it's just a really cool, I should have brought y'all one. Yeah, no, no, I, I've actually heard it, but it, it, okay. it, it, it's been out a while, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even really do a formal release because I'm not trying to pursue an, an artist situation right now. But it is just nice to have in my back pocket. And well, where can people find it? Is it uh, iTunes. Yeah and uh spotify i think but really neat story um the very first song on the record is called christopherson and obviously it's a tribute to him and somehow he got a hold of it 
And I have a video of him listening to it and weeping and telling me it's that's, one of his favorite songs. Oh, so that's, that's awesome. amazing. Uh, yet again, like, who cares about Grammys? That's I'll yeah. take that. That's my Grammy. Wow. Um, but that's awesome. That was really special. So sometimes you don't know why you're doing stuff. Like, when I was doing I'm like, why am I wasting my time doing this? And, you know, it's just those little accolades and those little moments and rewards that make the day in, day out grind worth it. Yeah, but that's what makes, you know, these new artists, that's what they fall in love with you guys about, the singer-songwriters, and they try to imitate what you guys are doing. Because I was, I was talking about it before where I used to get all those George Strait cuts with Jeff Stevens songs, and then I would get the songs, and we would hear the songs, and he would be imitating Jeff as a singer. You know what I mean? Totally. And, and those guys are fans of you. And, and that's what I mean. We, we, we've gotten lost a little bit where where they always have the new artist and they'll throw the writers in there. And the artist really ain't a songwriter. So then you kind of lose that fan thing from these from these new artists because they're they're forced to try to learn how to write songs. Yeah. But I feel like we're getting back to that fan thing where, the, where there's a lot of respect floating around now for the yes. songwriting process. And, um, and like you said, maybe it was Nashville. Maybe it was something like that that brought that to our attention. I know. I know. I'm just, I look forward to the days where, you know, the craftsmen are, you know, you think about Harlan Howard and Hank Cochran and Dean Dillon and, gosh, Bob McDill and unbelievable. I mean, the poets, like if it wasn't for them, there wouldn't be a George Strait or a Don Williams or whoever. You know, it's just yeah. um, I really love I feel like Nashville is at its best when the songwriters are writing the best songs. The singers are singing their best yeah. vocals. The musicians are playing, you know, the producers are producing. That's. To me, when it's just golden. Yeah, and and, and the thing that, that we always, you know, Jason doesn't really write a lot. Yeah. So he's like a big fan yes. of songwriters. But but the thing about it, I always look at it when I'm looking at an artist. It's like going, hey, man, is he an artist writer? And, I, and they like, how do you define that? And I say, well, you define that by does their writing define them as an artist? Mm. You know, because like Jason's writing doesn't define him, you know, but um, but he can write. Yeah. You know, but like Alan Jackson's writing defines him, you know, Absolutely. as as an artist or whatever. So Dwight Yoakam is a good example of that, too. But so th- that's interesting today. We, we don't have a lot of those guys where if you eliminated their writing, you know, would yeah. we would we know any different? You know, because you're because they're just kind of going back and forth. But now this new generation, the Luke Combs of the world, mm-hmm. some of these new guys are coming up where they are pretty, pretty interesting to watch. Oh, yeah. I love it. And I, it's it's hard to write sometimes with artists because we're in the day in day out with other songwriters and there's that lingo. But man, when you can write with an artist that truly is a great songwriter and try to get into their head and I mean it's just it's so much fun because it's yeah. already all the hard work is that done the yeah. heavy lifting they know who they are. And that's that's uh, that's the sign of a great songwriter is when you can pull something out of somebody else. To me, you know, yeah. like, like when I'm li- when I'm critiquing songs or we're listening or whatever, it's always like, you know, hey, man, we you know, this, you know, this song is is really in the place we need it to be. And it's usually because somebody's pulling something out of an artist, like whenever Jason's Jason's, like I said, is not a writer, writer. He's a good writer. Don't get me wrong. But it's funny when he writes with Neil and them, they can pull something out of him a little differently oh, yeah. than writing with somebody else. So uh, just like you, I mean, I mean, you know, you write with a lot of artists. Yeah. And 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 you get a lot of artist cuts that way. So that yeah. that's a big that's a big plus to you that you can pull that out and and keep yourself looking out outside in, you know, and helping that process. Yeah, it is. I mean, Miranda Lambert's someone I write with a lot that is so she's so Miranda. I mean, you know, you've she's such a real songwriter. I mean, so is so is Dirk. So I mean, there's most of them are really you know they've been doing it a long time and they know who they are well all the ones you've surrounded yourself with are are kind of songwriter guys you know yeah. dirks is a is a serious so- songwriter. songwriter you know miranda's a very serious songwriter yeah. you know and, and 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 that's good that you're kind of in there because you're an icing on the cake which is great you know but you came from being a very specific mm-hmm. songwriter for yourself and, yeah. and what you wanted to say i think that's an advantage i have being having been an artist because if they say well, I wouldn't say that. It's like, well, let's not say it. I mean, yeah. you don't... You get it. I get that. 100%. I would never... I mean, you know, and I... Even to the point where, you know, I have when I have a song, let's say, you know, Tim McGraw, he almost cut it, 
you know, I used to get really frustrated and it still hurts. Don't get me wrong. It stings when you miss that cut. But I've been there. I've been in the studio and you realize like this song doesn't fit anymore or we just cut a song kind of like it or this song beats it. What do you, you know, it's yeah. it, it, it this song this, wins. Yeah, best song wins and this is this artist's journey. What am I, who am I to say my song? You know, so yeah. but it is an honor when you get like you and Jason just to have a body of work and think up and smoke fits right here or. Yeah. You know. And that was the first song we that was one of the first songs we cut. That was the first four song session because Jason and I, we always try to find that yin and yang and we always try to find that show opener right mm-hmm. off the bat so we can set the momentum of the, of the album. And Up and Smoke was definitely that big time. Yeah. And the demo was kind of funky, too. You it know, was funky, yeah. you know, and, and we tried to funky ours up, you it know, to kind of fit it. But, um, J- you know, Jason can't go over the top sometimes like no. that. But we, we did all that vocal mess and all that stuff oh, that's great. that the demo had. Which is probably what got it to get cut, you know. Yeah. But David Lee, man, David can sing the phone. I was book, about to say, I mean, you, you know? can't beat a good David Lee Murphy demo. Yeah, so much swag. Well, they're not demos. It, <laughs> I know. it sucks. You <laughs> know, you get them and you're like, well, How do I beat uh, can this? we beat this? I don't know if we can beat this, but but you know, but were you singing backgrounds on that demo? I'm, yeah, I'm sure I was. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty much all. Of them. See, I didn't know this. From See, now on, I'm we'll hired. Be, we'll we'll now, be yeah, calling. We'll I'm be hired. calling now. Bring it on. No, I love it. Hey guys, it's Shalacy. Check us out on the web at KnoxCountry360.com or on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at KnoxCountry360. And I'm such a fan of yours. I want to brag on you, but like um, the new Aldine single, I mean, your production is just so good. Well, I appreciate it. It just, it's it's just so good. And I always, you're one of those producers when I'm listening to the radio, I'm like, God, who's playing that bass part? Or, Who's singing that background? Because I care. Because I'm listening to every single thing yeah. that you're doing. Well, the guy I use, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, old school guy, Peter Coleman, is one of the tracking guys, and and I, I like crediting him for a lot of the Sonics because he, you know, he comes from the old school '70s and '80s, like the Knack, Blondie, Pat Benatar. Mm. I'm going to kiss you all over, Hot Child in the City. He did all these records, so he records a different way. So that's why the stuff kind of stands out a little bit because he records and mixes them different. You know, and then we use Mickey Cones to hook some vocals, and 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 all that stuff is all part of that process of Jason's comfort, mm. and you get that out of that process because now he's he's in here singing the best he can sing because he's comfortable. Yeah. We're cutting the best stuff we can cut now because everybody's in a zone, you know, and and that goes back to your to your writing, you and Connie. You said y'all were in a serious zone. I mean, we so were. that's your go-to co-write. You know, when you, when you know, when you have your great idea and you know you don't want to lose it. You know, because y'all do a lot of co-writing. Oh yeah. And 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 I know it's frustrating when you have this great idea and you've just wasted it on a co-write that might not have worked. You yeah. know. So it's good that you have that 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 crew that you can count on. Yeah, I feel like kind of now I have all my little places where I can go where it's like. You know, I know who to write like a sad song or cheating song, drinking song. Um, so many different outlets for me, and I I'm pretty much a chameleon. You know, I I would say, compared to some of the other female writers, I kind of, I mean, I guess you could say I write heartfelt songs because of yeah. the the ones. But you know, something I really worked hard at and just need to have a couple hits with them or like the way I talk you know that's fun or David Ashley Parker or Up in Smoke like I'm not just you know over here crying in my beer writing like <laughs> mm-hmm. wrist slitting songs I'd write a lot of different kinds of songs I grew up on traditional country music blues bluegrass you know all of it and um, some of the lighthearted stuff I just haven't necessarily had the success with but I want to you know yeah 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 well I mean but, but it's not in your DNA to let a lyric go Sometimes and that's okay. I mean, you know what I mean. But that, but that's what makes these other songs you have so song of the year. You know. <laughs> know. But uh, but that's cool. Um, I'm very happy to uh, have you part of this show, and I appreciate you being here. Knox Country. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Knox Country Podcast. Special thanks go out to co-host Mr. Lacey Griffin and producer Donnie Walker. See you next time. outtakes i mean we didn't talk i mean do, are these people are people listening like want to be songwriters no it's going to be syndicated it's just going to be across country people. music radio it's going to be everybody and their uncles
Yeah, I mean... Some ants. And so... Sorry, can you pause? I got a joke. Oh, it's not a joke. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Sure? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is not live. I don't know what I got in my throat. This is not live or nothing, so don't worry about it. It's um, Knox Country 360, so if you... You know, you're listening can to Knox we, can I write Country. That out? Yep. Oh, really, you got to yeah. write three words on I, it? I, I don't... I, I, Knox I, I do. Country it's 360. It's 360. Hey, guys, you're listening to... Knox Country 360. <laughs> <laughs> Hey y'all! Don't forget to say your name. Rock. See, I already messed it up. That's good. That's awesome. That was go. a good one. That's awesome. That's fun. Should we just start recording? <laughs> yeah. That was a good run through. Shush. Yeah. That was a good run through. Now, come on. Knox Country Podcast Edition.